Fantastic. Hi, I'm Melora Norman. I'm the media specialist at Vassalboro Community School. Welcome to the Vassalboro Read 21, 2021 Speaker Series. We're so glad you could come. Just a couple of quick housekeeping tips before we get started. During the presentation, for the best sound experience, we ask that you keep your volume muted to minimize background noise. Afterward, we'll have time for questions and answers. And at that time, it will work best if everyone mutes their volume, except for the person speaking. Finally, we want to note that we will be recording this program and posting it publicly online. Without further ado, I'm very excited to introduce my fellow program coordinator, Brian Stanley, the Vassalboro Public Library Director, who will introduce today's wonderful speaker. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Melora. Um, thank you for everyone to everyone for joining the Zoom presentation series of the Vassalboro Community Read. Um, this project was made possible by a library's Transforming Communities grant from the American Library Association. Um, thank you to everybody who's been watching our videos so far, and please join us for a discussion series at the end of the month. Um, you could check vassalbororeads.me for more information. Um, also, make sure to visit the Box Mill Fish Ladder behind the Old Mill in North Vassalboro, and also the Weber Pond Fish Ladder, which is off of the Dam Road, um, which is right after Natanis on the Weber Pond Road. Um, you'll see a lot of alewives until the end of the month. Um, you can also check behind the Historical Society um, at the Outlet um, Stream Dam. Um, where you'll see a lot of alewives being turned back from the last barrier on the outlet stream. And you'll get a chance to see what alewives contend with um, all throughout the Northeast as they approach various barriers. Um, today we have Landis Hudson with us, um, the director of Maine Rivers, um, the group that secured much of the funding and coordinated many of the major fish pa passage projects in Vassalboro. Um, she will speak with us today about the life cycle and history of these fish and talk about why they are so important to bring back to Maine rivers, um, streams, lakes, and ponds. Um, and with, so without further ado, thank you, Landis, for joining us, and I will let you take the floor. Great. Thank you so much for inviting me. I am thrilled to be with you, even though I'm not, of course, physically with you. It's still... Um, a little bit unusual to talk to people over Zoom, but I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about the work that we've been doing to bring back this front of alewives to um, China Lake through the um, outlet stream. So I um, have chosen this image of an eagle and an osprey because um, I feel like it, it expresses some of the um, power and energy and the importance of rivers. So my organization is, is a, a, a nonprofit and our mission is to protect, restore and enhance river health. And so we are very interested in working on um, restoring native fish populations. So this evening, while, while we're talking, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my organization and a bit, bit about the project that we've been working on to bring back um, this run of alewives, um, this, truly um, epic migration, which is occurring now. I'm gonna talk uh, a bit about what we do, why we do it, give you an update on what's actually um, in the works for uh, our next season of work. And then I brought a couple books for show and tell. So off we go. So um, my organization um, is probably one of the smallest um, nonprofits around. Um, I'm the executive director. And as part of this project, we've brought together a large group of partners. And um, let's see here. How am I going to do this? Gonna work. Yes, OK. Um, to focus on um, restoring um, the alewife run to um, China Lake. So, our work, um, as we'll see, news and bad news. I'm sharing with you this basic graphic to to um, share the sad news that there are lots and lots and lots of dams in the rivers in Maine. And so this project, working on six, um, has taken the better part of um, seven years of work for my organization and a large group of partners. But there are many, many, many dams which were built um, over Maine's you know fairly long history. 
just a little more kind of big picture overview, a lot of the dams in our um, rivers and streams are quite old and they were put in place like the dams and that China Lake outlet stream for grist mills, um, for industries that are no longer um, in existence. So Maine does have, oh, about 120 um, hydropower dams, which produce energy, which goes into the grid. But the vast majority of dams that are found in our rivers throughout the state are old relic dams that um, are uh, really, in most cases, um, not serving any purpose. So unfortunately, it's going to be a big job to um, maintain them and keep them fixed. So lots of, lots of work has gone on in the um, state of Maine to assess the impact of these numbers of dams. And in the past um, decades, more and more people have become aware of the ecological impacts. Dams uh, have a number of um, impacts on rivers and streams. They, of course, um, don't allow fish to move past them. They slow the water down behind them and create um, an unnatural pond called an impoundment. That impoundment tends to be um, warmer. Um, sediment tends to drop into the impoundment instead of flowing downstream naturally in the way that the river ecology has evolved over thousands of years. Um, so dams have lots and lots of impacts. This is a um, screenshot from the mainstream habitat viewer. And my organization is one of many, many in the state that are working on improving river and stream health. And we look not only at dams, but also culverts. So this, this shows um, we're in um, Belfast there. So unfortunately we have lots of dams and lots of culverts. Uh, this is a researcher named Carolyn Hall, and I like to share information about her work because I find it, it um, ties us to history and gives us a big sense of why the work we're doing today connects us back to um, previous generations. So Carolyn is a researcher um, and when she was working on her master's thesis, she did an inventory of essentially all of the dams in Maine. And she went to archives, she went to libraries, she looked online and in books. And she was essentially trying to figure out how much the um, access to habitat for migratory fish had been reduced. How many dams were there in our watersheds and what kind of impact were they having? So it was a very, very big question, but one that nobody had really asked in a particularly systematic way. And she, she counted up dams. And as I say, she, you know, she did a road trip and then did a lot of um, work. She found 1,356 dams. And what I find interesting about her research is that most of those dams dating back to 1800, dating back to 1700, dating back to 16 something, most of those dams were still there. And um, as I say, they were put in place for grist mills, for old technology that no longer exists. And people have simply gotten used to them, but they have profoundly negative impacts on our waterways and especially on our fish. So, um, she found that only about 10% of what she called in her master's sea search kind of virgin uh, habitat. So um, migratory fish like alewives need to live part of the year in the ocean and they need to move into fresh water in order to complete their life cycle. So what Carolyn had found was that this large number of dams, 1,356, many of which still remain, had blocked off nearly 90% of the habitat. So it's kind of like having, um, you know, maybe you live in a house with eight rooms. Somebody locks the doors to eight of the rooms and they only get to go into one. Or as we've experienced in this strange um, pandemic, you know, there are just so many places you can't go. It's really like that for migratory fish. A lot of places that they would traditionally um, need to go or want to go to complete their life cycles are not accessible. 
so the impacts are um uh, we're gonna not gonna go too far into the um doom and gloom but in truth pretty pretty alarming so over the past um certainly 100 years the numbers of our native sea run fish fish that move between fresh water and our marine systems have declined tremendously uh, and we find that there are articles and research constantly um, reinforcing this idea that our freshwater biodiversity is enormously valuable. So our coastal areas um, and uh, tremendously valuable, but also imperiled, endangered. And the biodiversity of these natural freshwater systems is much reduced. So when these kind of um, networks and webs are not as healthy, it makes it more difficult for fish to complete their life cycle and for um, uh, birds and other fish and other creatures to um, have sources of food. So numbers are, are um, in truly a kind of shocking decline. One of the um, uh, periods that I, I'm interested in reading about is the 1860s when fisheries reports were done in the state of Maine. And in the 1860s, people were writing, Charles Ad Adkins was the first um, uh, commissioner of fisheries in Maine. And he wrote then and around the time of the Civil War about the impacts they were seeing of, of these old um, dams. And he noted a lot of the um, declines and was concerned. So many, Many people are unfamiliar with the creatures that um, have inhabited our waters and were there, you know, 100, 200, 500 years ago. I love putting in an image of the sturgeon because these are just mysterious creatures that um, today can be seen. If you go, for instance, to Hallowell, there's a beautiful um, public um, launch area um, where you can sit on the shores of the Kennebec River and watch sturgeon leaping. And they're, you know, bigger than we are, huge, magnificent fish that have been returning in, in um, much um, healthier numbers. And these are also creatures that require um, being able to move between freshwater and marine systems in order to complete their life cycle. And they have grown very large. It's interesting, there was a, um, report I read once about, uh, I think it was a 17 foot sturgeon. They found the bones in um, the uh, archeology span associated with Jamestown and, and people who, um, native people who, who lived in Maine um, certainly ate sturgeon. Their skin was used for leather um, and uh, many of the place names of our rivers and lakes are connected to these um, sea run fish. In the background of this image, I hope you can see a whole school of alewives. Alewives were um, enormously familiar to people 100 and 200 years ago, and they um, really don't have any tricky kinds of camouflage that other creatures might have. Alewives are not good at hiding. They're not good at scaring other creatures. They're basic operating mode is simply to exist in such vast numbers that lots of them can be eaten and still the schools will um, persist and exist. So um, it's this is the time when um, alewives, which um, technically are river herring, which consists of alewives and blueback herring together, um, they are related to Atlantic herring, which only stay in the ocean, but these guys uh, through the miracles of history have evolved to need to return to um, lakes and streams to, uh, to lay eggs to complete their life cycle. So this is the time now, um, sometimes um, late April and May, when these creatures historically return to our rivers in huge numbers. And people used to write about rivers running silver, which with such great numbers that you could walk across a river with such um, enormous numbers that somebody could take 10 barrels of fish. That The stories that people told about um, fish coming back in the spring are absolutely remarkable. And if you think about um, 
the perspective of a creature, perhaps a bear that's been hibernating all winter and perhaps, you know, comes to life uh, early, early in the spring before other plants are in bloom. This idea of a, a run of fish coming back to a stream coming up from the ocean, you know, pulled by the light and the desire to reproduce came as a magnificent gift because there are no other, um, uh, no other um, sources of food equivalent in terms of protein. So having these creatures come up, salmon, um, American shad, uh, smelt and, uh, alewives, blueback herring coming up in these huge waves must have just been a magnis magnificent and familiar sight both to people who had lived through a winter but also creatures like foxes and fisher that were able to finally have a huge meal after perhaps a long and hungry winter. So we do have um, a number of, of um, 12 different species and um, I'm happy to report that there's a great number of um, people and organizations like mine that are interested in these sea run fish, migratory fish, because of the importance of their ecology, moving between systems and essentially providing food, not only for the inland systems when these fish move into um, our rivers and streams and ponds and lakes where they can be eaten by uh, creatures, all types of birds and other fish. But then again, after um, young of year are born and migrate out of the river, they are a tremendous food source for the Gulf of Maine. So uh, haddock, um, halibut, um, many types of whales. If we can bring back large, healthy runs of millions and millions of these fish, it can only help build and rebuild the food webs, the connections that really have been um, tragically broken in the Gulf of Maine so that our, our fisheries can again be sustained. One um, image that you see here is of um, the palm of a hand and that tiny creature is an elver. So elvers, are fascinating and um, probably many people know they're uh, they are uh, in great demand because they are um, fished out of our rivers typically in March after they make a absolutely amazing trip up from the Sargasso Sea. So the Sargasso Sea is the one and only place where European and North American ale um, um, eels reproduce and they make their way, tiny, tiny creatures make their way on ocean currents and then um, make their way into rivers and streams where they live out their lives in lakes and then have to return to the Sargasso Sea where they reproduce. So their numbers are also in decline and it's a perilous voyage and kind of, kind of a crazy and amazing um, life cycle that they have. So the creatures that are caught from Maine are shipped to Asia because Asian populations of eels are not as healthy as they are in Maine. So it's, it's fascinating. But while people find that these um, creatures are economically valuable, you know, at times selling for, you know, $2,000 a pound, historically, they were also tremendously important in terms of ecology. Um, eels, which you know, grow to be three, four, perhaps even five feet in size as adults, make up, uh, tr historically made up a lot of the living biomass, the life of a river and lake. And so there were um, people who, who uh, um, enjoyed dining on, on, on eels, but also plenty of creatures, eagles, osprey, um, bear, foxes. So they were an important food source for many creatures as well. So um, how did Maine Rivers get involved in this um, interesting project in Vassalboro? Back in 2014, my board of directors 
thought that it was um, important to organize a conference to bring attention back to the Kennebec. So we held a conference in Waterville and focused partly on the main stem dams of which there are four, four hydropower dams, but we also looked at um, opportunities for restoration throughout the watershed. So the Kennebec is the second largest watershed in Maine. And I think it's fair to say that the watershed is really where the idea of river restoration, certainly in Maine and maybe even nationally was born. The Edwards Dam removal um, just about 22 years ago uh, um, was really nothing sort of nothing short of historic. That dam, which produced very small amounts of power, blocked the entire river above Augusta. And after um, a lengthy and you know fairly controversial and difficult time, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission determined that the ecological value of the dam was greater than the small amount of power it produced. So many, many discussions took place. That dam was removed. And then later the Fort Halifax dam was removed um, from the Sebastocook. And this essentially, these two dam removals turned the Kennebec and the Sebastocook into the most productive area on the entire East Coast for the production, for the creation of alewives. So going um, from essentially no alewives making their way above um, the Fort Halifax Dam, some years up to 6 million. So millions and millions and millions of fish are now able to make their way into the watershed. And there are tremendous numbers of eagles and osprey. I went on a um, paddle on the um, Sebastocook and we counted about 50 uh, eagles and there's just, it's just astonishing to think of that. So there are tremendous ecological benefits. And then of course, um, uh, economic benefits as well for the towns that are able to have an alewife harvest and sell um, alewives for bait to lobstermen. So many reasons that, that this kind of work is important. So um, one of the things that we did in this um, conference was to do some research and learn about restoration opportunities um, in the watershed. And I need now to take a moment and stop and give a great thanks to um, Jim Hart, who um, was really kind of the mastermind of the Alewife Restoration Initiative work that we've been doing, um, uh, connecting China Lake to the Sebastocook. Um, Jim had been thinking about this for a while and had had many, many conversations. He was um, at that time the president of the China Region Lakes Alliance, very um, creative and energetic, energetic person. Another um, energetic um, uh, and enormously helpful person was Jennifer Brockway with the Sebastocook Regional um, Land Trust. So those two, along with Nate Gray, who works for the Department of Marine Resources, really helped create a vision for how the project that we now know as the Elwife Restoration Initiative came to be. And as you can see here, the project at its outset consisted of six dams. So there were six small dams in the China Lake outlet stream that completely blocked it for fish passage. We know that <clears throat> No alewives had been able to make their way to China Lake since uh, before Maine was a state. We actually ended up having to go back into the archives, which were in Massachusetts, to find about some of the early history. So we essentially had to work on things site by site, location by location. And um, to date, we have removed um, two dams the Massey Dam and the Lombard Dam. And we've installed two technical fishways, the Box Mill Fishway and one at the Ladd Dam. So last year, we completed the um, Box Mill Fishway, which was um, a huge undertaking. And we are gearing up this year to work on the, um, the technical fishway that's gonna be installed at the Outlet Dam 
And there's also one more site where there's kind of a derelict dam, which here is listed as the fourth barrier. And we are working on plans to remove that as well. So um, China Lake was a, uh, considered a priority for the state of Maine in um, management plans of the Kennebec going, going back to the 80s and 90s when it really was kind of hard to imagine. And the Department of Marine Resources that um, 950,000 adult alewives um, would be able to spawn there. So it's a very, very large lake. And that we, we know that it was historically um, accessible. So this is, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the challenges in doing this kind of work. There is a lot to it. And it kind of amazes me that we've been able to make as much progress as we have. One of the things that's challenging is for people to think about change. And I guess that's true of all of us in many aspects of our lives. Change is always hard. And when we're talking about rivers and streams, um, often the dams that we're looking at have been there for 50 years. 150 years, maybe 250 years, and people will have gotten used to seeing them. Um, and um, sometimes people imagine um, a scene like this. This is actually the old um, mill associated with the, um, the Massey Dam, which was the first one we removed. And I put this picture in because I think it represents kind of people's ideal of, of this um, mill pond. And I think there's a, there was a concern that when you removed it, you would have something like this. Yikes, a giant mud flat. And you know, it ha we had many, many, many meetings on the order of 12 or 15 before we actually started doing any kind of work. And it's very, very common anywhere that you're talking about a dam removal for people to think, what are you gonna do? You're gonna take away the river. You're gonna turn it into a giant permanent mud flat. And actually this was a picture that we took before um, the removal of the Lombard Dam. And these are my two colleagues, Nate Gray with the Department of Marine Resources and um, Matt Streeter, who's our Alewife Restoration Initiative Project Manager. And they are in fact wearing uh, at some point snowshoes because we had to measure the amount of sediment that um, was potentially going to move downstream when the dam was removed. So all of this mud that you see was in fact underwater. And people are surprised. Ah, here they are. This is Nate and Matt. And you can see uh, at the bottom there, there's a pair of snowshoes. Who has ever heard of going snowshoeing on mud? Well, that's what you do if you don't wanna <laughs> slip into it and fear never getting out. So this was a super, super hot day. They were both wearing waders, snowshoes in the mud. And essentially we had to measure it as part of the permitting process. So each of these sites, each of these six sites setting requirements, which I am happy to tell people about afterward, but maybe not everybody needs to know everything about permitting, but trust me, there's a lot to it. So um, this actually is a um, uh, picture that was taken um, not very long after the um, Massey Dam was removed and you can see Hope you can see my cursor. This area here all was underground. I mean, underwater. And it had been underwater for generations. And you can see it's not a giant mudslide. This, this here is exactly where the dam was removed. And so as part of that project, we've been working to restore not just fish passage, not just bringing back the native migratory fish, but we've been working on plants and trying to make sure that the plants that have established themselves in these new banks, the new stream banks, which had been inundated for generations, don't turn into all non-native purple loosestrife and other things that we don't need, but turn into native plants. So with that, this is actually what it looked like um, um, not long after um, that first um, Massey Dam was removed. So this is of course not, um, not the kind of nightmare scenario that people imagine. Uh, it's quite lovely. And um, we worked hard to make sure that the um, 
plants that came in were native. So we planted lots of um, trees and shrubs and flowers. And we tried to include some that would be good for friends like um, butterflies. You can see in the background here, the remnant of the um, Massey Dam. But um, not all dams can be removed. So in my um, work, I often think about the pros and cons of um, removing a dam versus building a fish passage or a fishway or a technical fishway. And so as you kind of remember back to those first images of the map of Maine with all those like chicken pox dots all over the place, um, most of the dams in Maine have um, no industrial purpose and do not produce power. But it's difficult to um, figure out, um, honestly, how, how to remove them. It's almost always, in the long run, a lot cheaper to remove a dam. And in terms of ecological health, the benefits of removing a dam versus building a fishway, the dam removal is almost over, far, almost always far and away, less expensive and more immediate benefits. You get the water flowing, the water aerates, you get the natural stream banks. Um, there are tremendous benefits to it and it's a lot less expensive. However, in cases like in Vassalboro, that's not always possible. So in this case, um, working very closely with uh, Ray Breton, the um, dam owner that I'm sure many people in Vassalboro know, uh, he concluded that it was critically important to maintain the impoundment, the little pond behind the, the Lad Dam, because it was so important for local kids to have a place to swim. So we listened to him, thought about it, thought long and hard, listened to him, thought about it, waited, thought about it, talked to engineers, cogitated, et cetera, et cetera, and then eventually realized we were gonna build a fishway. <laughs> So this is the final um, uh, fishway, which as you might be able to imagine, it was quite an undertaking. The dam itself is not incredibly tall, but the fishway had to essentially go all the way around it. So it's basically like a bypass around the dam so that baffles can be put in place to slow down the flow of water to allow the fish to get up into it. So it re requires a lot of engineering you have to be able to think like a fish to figure out how you will attract the fish to the entrance of the fishway. Because um, if they go past it and swim right up to the dam, you really don't have a very good situation. So this took a lot of work. And then of course, the aesthetics were quite important to Ray. We didn't want it very high. So then we had to put in grading to make sure that nobody walked into the fishway. And this was what we were working on last year downstream. So this is, I hope many of you are familiar with it and I hope people have um, visited it. So next to um, the um, old mill place, the old um, woolen mill was a site that we brought many, many, many engineers to visit over quite a few years to try and figure out, it really was like a puzzle we had to deal with. Um, uh, the um, remnants of the dam, the fact that there was a bridge um, just past it, and if the um, some of the dam was taken out, it might change the velocity of flow and undermine the bridge, which we wouldn't, didn't want to do that. Aesthetics were very important. Ray knew that people liked to go down we had to have conversations about which side of the stream it would be on. Um, it took quite a few years of um, discussions um, with engineers. And here we see, um, I kind of like this picture of people wearing hard hats looking at it as we we're getting ready to start. And so this is Ray, um, Matt Streeter, the engineer, Joe McLean, and then two of the um, people that work for CPM. Actually, one is um, an RCS. So was it? long, um, long and exciting journey. And I can say exciting and joyful because um, we essentially completed it. So this is what it looked like in the midst of building the fishway. So the fishway itself had to be created first 
um, using plywood to create the forms to then put the concrete in. And every single bit of it had to be carefully engineered. And the people that were hired had to be comfortable having a high degree of, of, um, of um, detail and perfection because things had to be exactly right in order to make it work for the fish. Down here in the bottom left, um, we see Ray, that's me, Nate Gray from the Department of Marine Resources, Matt Streeter. I like this picture next to it because you kind of get a sense of um, just um, the scale of the site. So enormous amounts of work. And of course we were doing it in the summer with this um, new thing called COVID. Um, but the um, company that, we were, that, that was hired, CPM Constructors of Freeport, they had um, protocols in place and they followed them and that was fine. So this is what essentially um, it looked like um, in October and the fish essentially come in and then work their way all the way up the fishway. And you know, the, the taller the dam, the longer the fishway has to be. We also um, wanted to make this something like, um, something that really fit in aesthetically to the, to the site. And then we made sure that there were handrails so people could come down, visit it and, and be safe. Lots and lots and lots of work. And um, one of the things that was, I think quite wonderful about this project um, is that the Weber Pond restoration effort had concluded a few years before thanks to um, Frank Richards and Nate Gray, the town is familiar with that project where um, a small Alaskan steep pass fishway was put in. So the idea of bringing back a run of fish wasn't completely alien. People knew what we were talking about and they also knew that revenue could come into the town when the fishery was deemed sustainable and could be um, harvested. So some of these fish are going to be sold as lobster, lobster bait. And personally, I think it's really great to use, use alewives as lobster bait because um, they're native, we know what they are. They're not some sort of mysterious fish coming in from some other part of the world, potentially bringing in other kind of pathogens. They are local and they support local industry by um, being purchased directly um, from local harvesters. Having said that, some of the alewives that get um, harvested from Weber Pond are sent to Haiti. So there's still um, uh, interest in eating them um, in the Caribbean. And so this has been <laughs> a lot of, uh, you know, when I think back on this project, enormous amounts of meetings, phenomenal numbers of phone calls, infinite amounts of grant writing, but we've also managed to um, make it fun. So we have brought fifth and sixth graders onto to the site to help us with the um, replanting, the revegetation work. So they were able to um, help us plant trees. And here I asked them to, um, to show me what they thought alewife yoga would look like. So this was just a passing moment when they were doing uh, some form of alewife yoga on the stream bank. And I think, um, you know, of course, life being life, when the fifth and sixth graders were able to come out, it was often a really, really hot day, but it was fun. I think really nice for them to be able to see what we were doing. And my hope is that they'll feel a connection to the stream and be able to go down to the fishway at Box Mill or Lad and remember when it wasn't there and feel like they've been a part of this story of bringing something back. So this will be um, an epic migration. And I think it's in the order of, um, you know, the kind of um, stories about butterflies making their way all the way back to Mexico or the migration of caribou. It's, it's magical, mysterious. It's almost impossible to imagine. And these kids are gonna know that um, a project like this is something that can happen in a relatively short amount of time. And I hope they, they take pride in it and I hope they um, 
come down to the stream with their parents and grandparents and enjoy it. So project like this um, has been um, only able to happen because of a lot of partnerships. So we're really lucky to have people like um, Ray Breton, who are just wonderful to work with. The owner of the Massey Dam was just wonderful to work with. Um, the two towns, China and Vassalboro, have been great. The Sebastopol Regional Land Trust, extremely helpful. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Department of Marine Resources. Um, it really was um, wonderful to have so many um, groups interested in helping, um, especially because, yes, it was very expensive. None of this is very easy. Having to build um, three technical fishways was just mind boggling in terms of the amount of, of um, resources that was necessary. And the reason that we were able to do it is that people have come to the understanding that rebuilding these webs, rebuilding these connections in life, they do improve the health of the stream. They do um, allow us to bring back life to systems that had been broken and um, fish that had not been able to make their way back into their native habitat. So it's it's um, been very exciting to be a part of. Um, we're not done yet. Um, and now I come to the exciting show and tell part where I wanna tell you that um, don't just listen to me, you can read about these great stories. And um, the first, Thing I wanted to show you is a book called Running Silver by a guy named John Waldman. He put this out in 2013 and he writes about um, migration and history up and down the East Coast. So it's very well documented and it's a combination of science and history. It's really good. This book, Ill Wife by Douglas Watts, is pretty cool because he takes you into the archives of Maine and you can hear the voices people writing in 1820 who were pretty irritated that the fish weren't coming back into their rivers. So that I found uh, really eye-opening and interesting. And it's so fascinating to read about what was going on in all of our coastal communities because these problems with dams and fish were, were happening all over the place. Next, I will share with you this book from the Presumpscot. The Presumpscot, of course, um, flows through Westbrook and has taken a tremendous amount of work to bring it back to life. It actually, um, of course, we think of the ice disc, that's kind of an interesting um, twist to it, but there was a lot of legal work that actually sent um, um, consideration of the Presumpscot all the way to the Supreme Court to, to um, get fish passage. So the work there, has been going on for many years and will continue on longer than um, my life, alas. Excellent, phenomenal new book, From the Mountains to the Sea. This is about the Penobscot River. Beautiful pictures, amazing story about the restoration of that tremendous river, the meaning and importance to the Penobscot Indian Nation. Also just a beautiful book by Peter Taylor. Last but not least, don't you need to read to your kids? Swimming Home, a book by Susan Hand Shetter with beautiful illustrations from Tilbury House Nature Books. Something for everybody. I bet tons of these books might be in the Vassalboro Library. And if they're not, I'm sure you could get them through interlibrary loan. But the stories of rivers are so compelling. They really are interesting. And I, I think um, I should just um, perhaps close by telling you that this is the time to go have a look. So go down to Box Mill, see the fish there. If you go to the Maine Rivers website, which is mainerivers.org, we have a, an alewife trail map. There are places like Damariscotta Mills um, where uh, you know everything in this time of COVID is, is somewhat up in the air, but next year hopefully things will be good and there will be a nice big ly festival there there's a lot of work going on throughout the state and other places to try to bring back runs of native sea run fish including um gardner including yarmouth kennybunk 
um, Waterville, up and down the St. Croix. So there are plenty of places where you can um, see fish not yet going where they want to go. But we hope that for uh, future generations, there will be more happy stories, more celebration, and more kids growing up um, knowing that um, fish have been welcomed back to the rivers and streams where they used to live and can come back again. So that's pretty much it for me. But I would be um, happy to take any questions if there are any. Okay, we'll start with um, Sue Taylor. I'll just ask you to unmute here, Sue. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Wonderful presentation. Um, and Brian, I think we need all of those books in the library. My question sure. at the moment is, will there be ongoing monitoring of the beneficial or otherwise effects of all of these changes as dams come out? And will there be reports to the public so that people will be aware of how much you're accomplishing? Uh, yes, there's um, a lot that goes on and there is a fair amount of information that the Department of Marine Resources collects. So they do what's called trap counts and they do um, collect a lot of information. Some um, types of um, fishways and situations are easier than others to um, collect information about. So for instance, at Weber Pond, um, you know, there's that, um, call it a steep pass. There's that fishway there and then there's a pool where the fish collect and there's actually somebody there counting them. So um, if that, um, that's, a, that's one example of a place where information will be collected. Um, we'll definitely be doing a lot of monitoring um, um, along the way for this one as well. Um, partly because it takes a while to be able to have the run deemed sustainable. Mm -hmm. And you, you can't go harvest the fish as soon as you see them. You have to be able to get the okay. And that is kind of a, um, a bit of a process. So you have to collect samples of the scales and you have to figure out what the balance of male to female and age classes. So there is, um, yeah, there's a lot of monitoring that goes on. Sometimes I wish a bit less, but trust me, there's plenty, yeah. <laughs> And in the course of that, do any of these places have a webcam that people can watch the fish? Um, I know that Benton has uh, at times set up a webcam. They have had, um, you know, for their um, ill wife festivals. Um, but beyond that, I'm not sure. That's a good question. It sure would be fun. Yeah, right. it sure would be fun. Um, getting one underwater, we've often thought about ways to kind of put a camera in there to try and, um, it's actually not always easy to um, count fish if you have lots and lots of them moving through a small area. There's like, there's science and then there's like, cross your fingers. So mm -hmm. stay tuned if you, if you have any, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of room for improvement, I think in the realm of like engineering and how we do it. So I'm hoping we'll find some enterprising, maybe engineers from the University of Maine who can figure out how to make some of the things that we do easier, faster and cheaper. Yes, <laughs> but, well, thank yeah. you. Sure. Any other questions from anybody? Try raising your hand. What maybe Michael did. Um, I can ask a question real quick. Um, we have a question from um, Poulin here. It says okay. Madeline Poulin here. Let me yeah. unmute him. Landis, I sent you two chat messages, one of which you've already answered. Look at the other one. I'm not sure I can see any chat message. Yeah, I don't see them either. Did you send them directly to her? Yes. Um, Okay. Um, I don't, you know what? I don't see, maybe what I should do is stop. Shall I stop my sharing? Sure, sure, that's fine. Okay. I hope you guys don't see my messy screen. Aha, chats, okay, let's see. 
Oh, uh, <laughs> have you seen the dozen or so bald eagles walking along Route 32? They are too fat to fly. <laughs> good, good point. And could I please take a moment to brief, briefly acknowledge the funding sources? Absolutely, yes. And in fact, it was a little bit awkward with my um, my setup here. So we have gotten funding from dun, 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 a number of sources. Um, Patagonia, the Elmina B. Sewell Foundation, Davis Conservation Foundation, the Nature Conservancy, Maine Outdoor Heritage Fund. We are very grateful to the town of Vassalboro and China. Benton also chips in. Fish and Wildlife Service has been great. Um, DMR has been helpful. Um, we have gotten funding from the Maine Natural Resource Conservation Program. I think I put that in there twice by accident. NIFWIF, the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation and then um, NRCS. So, and that's only, that's only partial. We have received um, funding from the China Lake Association, from them as a whole, from individual members, um, many, many generous people. Maine Community Foundation has been enormously helpful. And then we also received funding from an anonymous foundation. So boy, have we been busy and um, it's been, um, I think of it kind of like a quilt, you know, it's all these little pieces and some big pieces and um, it's all come together so far, but you know, we have a busy summer coming up and like lots of other people in the world, the cost of um, materials is somewhere between alarming and concerning. So many, many things are, are expensive. We've also been really, um, pleased to have help from you know the local conservation commission they've been wonderful and were able to um, um, support us because you know really at the beginning it, it's it's kind of a lot for people to wrap their brains around the idea that um, uh, res restoring uh, uh, a fish that hasn't been seen for generations could be beneficial um, I hope that people will um, as the fish run comes back, I hope that people um, may find ways to, you know, to celebrate and, and um, have it be something that helps local businesses um, when people want to come to town um, in May um, or, or in, the, in the autumn when the fish are out migrating. So thank you for the opportunity to thank our funders. Where would we be without them? Nowhere. <laughs> Okay, any more questions? Anybody? Oh, nice books there. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to put in a quick, um, a quick, quick uh, advertisement because this um, whole program actually arose from um, a grant that we have gotten to purchase these books and have a community read. And so yeah. And one of them is one of the books that you had on your list, which is Swimming Home, the children's book. So that we have not only library copies at both the Vassalboro Public Library and the Vassalboro Community School Library, but um, you know we can check them out, but we are also giving many away. And then we also have some, I don't think it was in your list, it's called The Al Alewives Tale. It's probably oh, yeah. backwards. And yep. it's by uh, Barbara Brennesal. And she, she all, all of our authors are also giving talks. So, um, right. so it's a series, and so it's very exciting. And Brian's done a huge lion's share of of bringing these together. But um, yeah, so books, yes, yay! There's yeah. a lot to celebrate. And, yeah. So I want I want to ask a quick question. Well, actually, I sort of had to, I Brian showed me the other day um, how right at that out that last barrier, how the fish. I felt so bad. The fish are flopping. They can't get up there. So. So they're getting that far. So it's just kind of miraculous. How did they remember after not coming for a long time? How did they remember to start coming again? And well, then I, what is yeah. going to happen to the ones that are flopping there? I'm so worried about them. Well, um, so the, the fish, um, some adults have been moved into the lake by the Department of Marine Resources over the past six or so years. And um, the fish that were actually brought up and put in, um, you know, brought up by truck and then brought into the lake, were able to um, reproduce. And then um, those adults would leave 
And then the juveniles are also programmed to get out of the lake. So it is not, uh, it has not been possible for fish to get into the lake on their own and they, but they can get out of it sort of. It's not a great situation. They've had to bump over the dams and like, it's just not a great situation. So that's, that's what we're um, working on this coming summer is fi fixing the fishway at the outlet dam. Um, most fish that are stymied in their attempt to get where they wanna go will eventually turn around, give it up and go back out to the ocean, which is certainly uh, a, a, a 60 or 70 mile waste of their life energy, but most of them will simply um, give up, turn around and not reproduce. Some may be able to reproduce in the, um, in the, in the um, one of the impoundments. And um, we will be doing our best to, to move some of them by hand over the dam, but it, we've really been um, uh, focused on getting the work done as fast as we can so that the fish that come back can make it and can, can live and not, not perish. Thank you. Yep. But that, I want to help them into the lake. I'm, I'm going to show up with my net and my bucket, like certainly, in the story. Certainly yeah. eagles and osprey um, take note. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, the life of the owl wife is not always glamorous and many get eaten yeah. and, you know, yeah, that's part of the plan. Um, what's what's the next project for Main Rivers after um, after Vassalboro is completed? Uh, after Vassalboro, we're gonna well, we're not done yet. I mean, so we have we have right. um, two sites to work on. Um, we have been doing some um, outreach and help to other communities that are working on similar restoration projects or thinking about it, you know, it can, can take years and years and years to get an idea, you know, get the desire to do something into a place where you can actually, you know, start getting the permits and make a plan to actually mm -hmm. put things in motion. And what I hope to be able to do for a certain amount of time is share some of the lessons that we've learned and help kind of pick up the pace and, um, find as many ways as possible for um, other communities to do work. So there's a group of people in Gardner that are very um, energetic and working on um, a restoration project in Cobbesee. There's um, a Madame Extreme project. Upstream, yep. Yep, mm -hmm. yep. My hometown, I mean, where I live in Yarmouth, we have two broken fishways that, you know, we're trying to sort out. So there's a, there's a lot to, there's a lot to do. Um, so we'll be sharing some of our lessons and um, trying to find ways to um, help help uh, other communities learn to do things, uh, you know, faster, easier, and um, more quickly. Because the, there's there's a huge need for restoration, but it's um, generally very very slow. It's hard to hard to move quickly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions? Before I ask mine, or I was I was going to ask about the outlet stream as well. Um, so it is possible for the fish to um, spawn in those, in maybe like above the lad dam up there, where it's there's kind of those ponds. Or, yep. I mean, it's kind of a pond, but. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. So yep. That's great. Yep. And then there will be blueback herring that um, look an awful lot like alewives. You know, most of us, you know, I have twin daughters, identical twins, and people can't tell them apart often. And then, you know, alewife, blueback herring, most people can't really tell them apart. They look very, very similar. They're very um, similar. However, alewives need um, lake or pond habitat, and blueback herring will reproduce in um, rivers and streams. So we have ha found that there are some blueback herring that are coming back to the outlet stream. So they will um, do well. Yeah, so it's an exciting project. I mean, it, it's, it's yeah. you know, not without challenges and it kind of amazes me that we've gotten, gotten it done. And it's been, um, you know, we've been um, 
lucky to have gotten to know a lot of really nice people and um, our project partners have been just um, astonishingly energetic and um, no two sites are the same. No two towns are the same. The rivers in our, our state face a lot of the same challenges, but they're also um, um, unique. And um, you try and try and use some of the same solutions, but um, um, just in the same way people are different, you have to kind of adjust things. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, with that being said, I'll, I'll wrap it up. Um, thank you so much, Landis, for joining us today. And yeah, we're very appreciative of you supporting our project. And we're going to do our best to push all this information out there, make sure people visit these fish ladders, and we'll keep the community informed as uh, you complete your projects this, this summer. So. And, you know, for those, for those winter days, there's lots of great reading about rivers, and they are wonderful and inspiring stories. Yeah, I'll check into those books, definitely. Great, thanks all, good night. Thank you, Landis. Take care, everybody. Bye.